this whole uh, thing today, how to recruit superstars for your recruitment business. Um, and uh, why this subject? Well, over the last couple of weeks in launching this book, I have spoken to loads of you, okay? Lots and lots of business owners, recruitment business owners worldwide. And I ask every single one of them, you guys, you know, that are on this call, you may have heard me say this question, what's the number one challenge in your recruitment business right now? What's the one thing that frustrates you, the one thing that, you know, really it's, it's a struggle in terms of being able to, to, to do this? Overwhelmingly, and in fact, I've spoken to over 57, about 60 recruitment businesses in the last couple of weeks. And all of those owners have opened up and they've told me about the businesses, their businesses and the challenges that they face. The number one universal challenge was finding, recruiting, training, motivating and keeping or retaining great recruiters. And today I want to help you guys by tackling not all of that today but a major, major part of it. So look, today I'm going to show you, or, or uh, I suppose I'm going to show you how you can learn from the seven biggest howlers that I've made in my recruiting career, over 27 years of doing this, the seven biggest mistakes that I ever made. And what I'm going to hope is that you'll learn from those mistakes and, 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 and hopefully not repeat them. Um, but also, um, yeah, how you can avoid making those same ones. So the seven biggest recruiting mistakes I, I made. I'm also going to talk to you about nine killer questions that you must ask. So that's a bit of a quick fire thing. I'm not going to labor those things. I'm just going to say to you, these are the nine killer questions that you must ask if you are recruiting recruiters, you're trying to bring somebody in to, to work for you, whether they're a rookie, whether they're a veteran, uh, whether they're your best friend, whatever. If you're going to bring them into your business, you have to be asking these nine questions. And then finally, right at the end, I'm going to give you um, actually, I'm going to give you a couple of bonuses today. Um, finally, at the end of today's presentation, I'm going to give you a killer strategy. All right, a strategy that one of my mentors talked to me all those years ago, and it's something that I've used not only in my recruitment businesses, but in my in my training business and with all of my coaching clients. I teach them this one strategy, and I'm going to share that with you today um, as a bonus. But you need to hang in, all right? So uh, keep in there. If you and, uh, we'll take them all at the end. Okay. So look, I I've been where you guys are, all right? The people out there, if you're business owners, I've been where you've been, um, and many of you will know already that I've worked with. In fact, I've worked for over 27 years. <laughs> That definitely makes me feel like the oldest uh, it in the room. 27 years in the recruitment industry as a junior consultant. I started as a rookie in my first recruitment role as a consultant. So I progressed from that junior, that rookie, to a consultant, a senior consultant, a manager, a business owner, um, a mentor, and a coach. So all of those roles I fulfilled in our industry, 27 years of doing it. And still to this day, I know it's challenging for, for us. There are days that go by that you do question your sanity a little bit in this industry. But I've got to say to you, 27 years in, I'm still loving it. I'm loving the vibrancy and the energy and everything else that we get from this. Now, not many of you will know that I've grown three very successful, very highly profitable recruitment businesses of my own. So recruitment companies of my own, as well as mentored and coached hundreds of business owners worldwide to launch and grow their own recruitment businesses. I've trained over 37,500, that's correct, 37,500 recruiters worldwide through my live training events, through my video products through my online training, uh, every now through my books, thank you number one, or, uh, Amazon bestseller, thanks to you guys. Some of my clients, you know, there are too many of them to kind of uh, mention, but there's a few up on here, Orange or Everything Everywhere as it's known now. Um, uh, 
who else? We've got uh, Pertemps, one of the largest independent recruitment groups in the UK, privately owned. The Al Raji Bank, one of the largest banks or the largest bank in Saudi Arabia. So loads and loads of uh, of, uh, of recruiters worldwide, 37,500 throughout, you know, 23, 33 countries, um, and still going strong. Um, these are three, you know, I, I always kind of think it's it's one thing to have, um, you, you know, me saying to you, look, you know, my training's good and everything else, but actually I like real people to sell it. So each of these people up on this screen, and this is a very small snapshot, obviously, but these three people have all experienced uh, the work that I do and more importantly the results that uh, m my work gets for them. So um, I'm not going to uh, bore you by reading through those things. If you uh, are interested, these are three directors uh, running their own businesses um, uh, and you know, getting the kind of results that I know you guys are really interested in. Okay, um, I was extremely fortunate, okay, extremely fortunate, blessed in fact, to have had and worked with three of the most influential and successful and generous mentors in the recruitment industry during my early career. So um, let's start with, I suppose, the guy in the middle. Most of you, uh, certainly actually the UK customers and the US customers will recognize James Kahn. Dragon's Den fame, and I think, in fact, I know he does a series that's broadcast in America, a CBS uh, uh, um, uh, program with regards to business startups. Well, if you guys didn't know this, James had a very successful recruitment organization, grew it, sold it, etc., um, and now uh, is the chairman of a private equity company. Well, I set up and ran my first recruiting business with James. Okay, so I set up and ran my first recruitment business with James. I will tell you it, that was a disaster, not because of him, but because of me. And I'll tell you what you know what I did about that and 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 how it brought me to the place that I am. The guy on your left hand side with the glasses, the braces, uh, the double cuff shirts, and showing us his three fingers there, his, his other arms cut off, is the late great. Tony Byrne. Um, for our, our American cousins that are listening in, Tony, if you never experienced Tony, you, you've you missed out on something. You know, if you can grab any of his DVDs or video products or whatever, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. In my mind, uh, probably the best, um, uh, the greatest, in fact, recruitment coach trainer that ever lived. And I was blessed to have done my apprenticeship with Tony. So one of my earliest mentors. The lady to the right-hand side, is um, Anne Swain and uh, for you guys that are based in the UK Anne you'll know very familiar in our recruitment industry um, prominent speaker I've been around the recruitment industry longer than I have in fact um, and uh, she was one of my earliest mentors so um, and, and she's the chairwoman sorry of APSCO the Association of Professional Staffing Companies uh, you can always Google any of these guys, you'll find out all about them. So look, I was really blessed to have those mentors, but let me tell you about that situation with uh, that first business with James. Um, I launched that business, I was a recruiter, okay, uh, just like you guys, and, and, and you know, if you're a recruiter now, or if you're a business owner now, if you're a business owner now, you're probably a recruiter at one point. And like me, you were probably pretty good at it, you know, pretty decent at it. We knew how to make money. And we all go through that thing of, well, I'm doing this for somebody else. I'm pretty good at what I do. I know I'll start a recruitment business. And we presume, I certainly did, that just because I was a good recruiter, I was going to be a great business owner or recruitment business owner. Wrong. Um, I, it just doesn't work like that, you know. I, I I was a recruiter. I knew how to make placements. I could smell money, and I I could ch you know chase money. I knew what to work on, what candidates to speak to, how to qualify. Running a recruitment business, I don't need to tell you, business owners, is a completely different ball game. And even though I had the support of people like James and Tony and even Anne, it's like I just didn't know. So um, what I did, you know, one of the earliest lessons that I got from these mentors was don't reinvent the wheel. You know, find people that are doing this and study. I've made myself a student of our industry. 
any of you that know me very, very well will know that I am a voracious uh, uh, eater. No, I'm a voracious um, student of anything, any literature that will help me, my clients, um, my coaches, anything that will help further me and, uh, and these guys in their careers. I'm just devouring that content. So on my Kindle, you know, I don't know how many books are on there now, but I've got five books that I'm constantly reading simultaneously. I flip between five different books. God bless Kindle. Right, so um, I studied it essentially, and, and look, I know you've read the book, that my story is there in terms of where I was brought up and all that kind of stuff, but essentially what I did was I, I found out how the most successful recruitment businesses ran, how they operated, and I modelled it. I came back to that business with James and together with our third partner as well, a guy called Tony Cox, we absolutely smashed it. Okay, We got some phenomenal results, um, uh, phenomenal results, not only in how I recruited but more importantly in terms of growing a recruitment business um, by attracting great people to come and work with me and to stay working with me. That was one of the, the challenges. In my first company, in that first business with James, I recruited six star billers in my first nine months. Now, star billers is like, you know, people go, oh, is it 100,000? Is it this? Is it a million? Whatever it is, it's whatever's relevant in your industry. You know, in that industry, the fees were traditionally very, very low, but we carved out. I mean, just to let you know, in, in when I came back to that business, I took uh, my specialization from an industry average of 125 to 15% contingency to 30% retained fees 100% of the time. So that business that I grew with James and with Tony was phenomenal. And I've got to say to you, it's not the only one. The last business that I was involved in, I, I went to work for um, the UK's largest, uh, sorry, lar yeah, UK's second largest uh, recruitment business, a £350 million turnover PLC. I set up and ran their executive search division for them. And there I had 25 consistent revenue generators um, that I handpicked, trained, developed, and managed from scratch. So this system works. Now I'd love to say that my selection system was foolproof and I, that I never got it wrong. I did, okay. But it, but I learned from my mistakes and um, and I continue to learn. You know, but people will tell you I'm 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 really humble. I never ever think that I've cracked it because I haven't. The moment you think that, something else will come along and and, and bite you on the backside. So. I never assume that I know everything and, and, and always, despite whatever systems I have and every procedure I put in, there will always be the anomaly. Um, but this selection system, the techniques and the strategies I want to teach you today are the exact ones that I've used in all of my recruitment businesses and they're the exact ones that I teach my private coaching clients to use within their businesses and they're getting phenomenal results. So look, two myths that I hear, uh, myths, myths, whatever, two things that I hear from every single business owner in recruitment, right? Can you guess what those are? Number one myth, right, the number one myth, Roy, we should be able to easily recruit for ourselves. <laughs> and the number two, you never really know how good someone is until they start working for you. Now, even though I know they're myths, they're actually truisms, aren't they? Um, isn't it an irony that we can recruit absolutely superbly well for our clients and get paid for it, but when it comes to recruiting for ourselves, we struggle more often than we get it right. Is that true for you guys? I just used to think it was bizarre. You know, I, I don't know about you, but I've pulled off some amazing placements for my clients. Um, you know, I've placed candidates that other people probably wouldn't touch, you know. And it wasn't that I was a massive hero or something, but I was good at what I did in the same way that you guys are good at what you do. But boy, I've made some real howlers, real howlers. In 27 years of working recruitment, you can imagine, I've interviewed and employed a massive number of recruiters, uh, you know, across lots of different specializations in lots of different countries. Um, 
and, and I've learned some stuff. You know, unfortunately, I made some big mistakes, and it's those that I'm going to share with uh, with you guys today. So, um, I hope let me just pull that off to the side. Good. Okay. So I hope that you can um, still see my screen. Let's have a look. Okay. So um, I've basically I've changed the names of some of these guys. So I think just to protect their identity, and also I know that some of them actually still work in our industry. So I don't want to upset them, and I don't want to upset you if you've got any of them working for you. But look, let me tell you about Pete the Pro. Okay, Pete the Professional. One of the biggest mistakes that I ever ever made was being fooled by this guy right he looks cheesy doesn't he Pete the pro Pete was absolutely fantastic on paper all right he was even better at interview he'd worked in recruitment Pete had worked in recruitment for oh, about 10 years um, and for some massive recruiting companies his figures his stats were impressive and he swaggered through my selection process telling me that he was gonna smash targets and uh, what was his other one I'm gonna <laughs> just think about all the words he, he used to say to me well, I'm gonna shake up the other recruiters uh, working with you guys um, and I'll be honest I was flattered you know my first response I was absolutely flattered that this guy had chosen our little firm um, given the, the brilliant experience that he had and I was looking forward to have a consistent biller on the team you guys would too right how wrong was I how wrong <laughs> did I get that Pete was forgive my swearing but Pete was a bloody nightmare from day one okay during his induction week he proceeded to tell me how rubbish our database was compared to the one he used in his last company how terrible the other consultants were um, why our adverts don't work or didn't work he blamed everyone else but himself you know everyone else for his poor activity but himself is always offering um, you know, we didn't ask for any of these opinions, but unsolicited opinions on other members of staff. Um, and it, I'm sure when my back was turned, he was probably doing the same, you know, talking about me. Pete had more, this is a shocker for me, right? He had more candidate dropouts, and we had to issue more rebates in his first six months than our entire company, our entire company had in the three years prior to working with him. Uh, prior to him joining us, um, my biggest mistake was letting Pete stay there for eight months. You know, and uh, and I'm really embarrassed to say that. You know, uh, I'd like to think of myself as a good manager, a good owner, but it, we can still be good and still make mistakes, right? At first, I've got to admit I didn't stand up to him, and that's because I was scared. I was scared not of him, but of losing his potential revenue and potential, you know, <laughs> in very, very capital letters because we, we didn't see any of it. It was potentially always going to be good, but the realistically, um, and in fact, we didn't get any, all right? Um, eventually, I had it out with Pete and, and, um, uh, and to his credit, actually, I, I found out he did respond to authority. I just should have got a, got hold of it earlier. Um, he left shortly afterwards, but I still see him popping up at different recruitment companies and different uh, events and, and conferences I go to. So look, why am I telling you about Pete the Pro? What I learned and what I want you to take away today is never, ever let it slide like I did. Never ever let it slide. You know, nip it in the bud. Take action. That that niggly feeling that I had within, a, in fact, even before I took him on, but within days of him coming on, that induction period, him telling and moaning, him talking about other people, him blaming other people. I knew in my gut that he was wrong, but actually, I I, I let it slide. And I, I, you know, I'd like to say to you, I'm never going to do that again. Just learn from my mistake. Beware the old pro. Don't be fooled by the potential revenue, but concentrate instead on immediate results. Sometimes it's easier to train someone brand spanking new from scratch than it is to try and educate somebody um, that's got really bad habits. Um, now I'm laughing as I've brought this uh, <laughs> this guy up. Meet Mike, the manager. He looks impressive, doesn't he? Hand on the hip, hand on the hip, and showing us all of his charts. What is that? Some sort of uh, graph I think he's doing there. And he looks very impressive, doesn't he? Well, Mike 
Mike, the manager working for me, was great. And um, you know the type, right? I'm sure some of you out there are going to be giggling. Um, uh, tell me if you recognize Mike. He was keen to tell me at Into what a great manager he was. Um, and, uh, you know, I was listening to this guy. It seems like he'd swallowed every single, um, you know, in fact, he, had, he was the platinum guide to management. That's He'd swallowed the platinum guide to management. And every single platitude, management quotation, uh, you know the types of things. Um, uh, it, it just seemed like they were just rolling off his tongue. Every Every sentence he had blue sky this or think outside the box or there's no... I in team or whatever. Um, some of my best ones I've got from uh, Mike, the manager. Um, and but basically, look, what he told me was he told me not to worry. Um, he, he told me that he's going to have my back, and uh, he would quickly whip the team into shape. These were all the promises that he made. Mike didn't last long. My, my consultant sniffed him out within the first week. He spent so much time drawing beautiful graphs. Beautiful pie charts. Um, the guy was a whiz with Excel and uh, PowerPoint, etc. He used to collect stats and ratios and produce fantastic looking reports, but he forgot the vital ingredients of a profitable recruiting company. The three most vital ingredients clients, candidates, and colleagues. Um, might lost their respect in that in that first quarter, so they sniffed him out in a week. But in that first quarter, he always had a reason why he wasn't going to join them in the new business sessions, or you know, in those generation sessions like your power hours. He just always had an excuse. Oh, you know, I'm doing this proposal. Oh, I've got a client meeting. Or he's just never there. Um, he also should, the other thing is these fancy powerpoints. They were so good that he used to leave his own activity f figures out of them. Um, I don't know how we were fooled by that, but um, you know they used to be so pretty and whiz bangy that uh, we used to ignore the fact that uh, we couldn't see his activity. And if there was ever any good stuff, he would try and steal the credit from the consultant. So for a client meeting, for example, if he inv invited himself to attend, he would steal the credit from the consultant that had booked it. Mike the manager got a nickname in our business and uh, it wasn't a very kind one if I'm being really honest but it was a very true one so the consultants used to call him can't bill won't bill um, he was managed out of the business after two consecutive uh, poor quarters again six months actually a long long time and, and it's not one that I'm very proud of the lesson for all of us in this is managers leave from the front they lead with activity and they lead with revenue they walk the walk and they talk the talk. Do not be fooled. If you're a manager out there, um, you know, it's really, like I said in the very beginning, I, you know, I'm no different from a lot of us that I was a good recruiter and then I was made manager and then I was a, you know, a reasonable manager and I, I, I then decided that I wanted to run my own recruitment business. I wasn't qualified for any of those things. I either had to learn quickly or fail spectacularly and I did both. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you can. Can you learn spectacularly and fail quickly? Yeah, you can do those things too. Um, where possible, business owners, where possible, promote your managers from within, but skill them up first. Okay, If you've got somebody in mind, start working with them on their management and their leadership skills, etc. Way ahead of the game. Don't promote them. Someone's left, someone's died, whatever, and you just promote somebody and you haven't given them the tools for the job. You know, that's unfair. It's probably, you know, how Mike got into the trouble that he did. Um, remember that your top consultant won't necessarily be your best manager. I was explaining to somebody this the other day that, you know, what's interesting, I, you know, having worked in it for 27 years, I'll tell you the basic trait of a big biller recruiter um, is selfishness. And, and I don't say that with any, you know, sort of uh, what's the mad axe to grind or whatever as a recruiter I was selfish but selfish in the way that a goal poacher would be you know somebody that sits around uh, the penalty area and is looking for the tap in is looking for somebody to get them in the balls so they can take it over the line a goal poacher and you know goal poachers would sell their grandmother to get that ball over the line that's what a good consultant is about someone who's selfish that's focused that's driven um, those are the more positive words obviously to use a manager is almost the complete opposite of that um, 
a manager is generous, generous of their time, generous of their knowledge, just generous. Um, but the mistake I think a lot of new managers or new owners make is that they take their eye off the ball in terms of their own personal revenues and what happens is that their revenues suffer, the consultants that they're mentoring or training or whatever, they never quite reach that gap or bridge that, uh, that difference in revenue and so your whole business, you know, the team or the whole business it goes down, you know, it, it, the revenues suffer and then it's the boom and bust thing that we all very, very familiar with. So remember your top consultant won't necessarily be your best manager, it requires a very different skill set. Let me tell you about this guy, Stefan. Stefan, remember I have changed his name but it's not that far off. Stefan, I used to call him the sloth, the sloth, I don't know if you guys would say that. I took on Stefan as a sales manager. I thought he was absolutely brilliant at interview all right I thought it was brilliant we shared a similar interest in sports he liked football I liked football um, he had a really dry sense of humor the guy could just crack me up with just you know just his look he didn't always look this asleep um, but he was very relaxed he was very laid back he was just a decent bloke and and I liked him I took him on the problem was that he was really lazy he couldn't be bothered, all right, in any aspect of his life, his work, his personal environment, it was just lazy. Um, Stefan would rather have sent out a hundred emails than pick up a phone and speak to somebody. Now, call me old school, but I just, I, I can't get my head around that. I, you know, I'm all for technology, I'm not a dinosaur, despite contrary opinion. I embrace technology, but not to replace communication, but to speed it up. To um, to get more done, um, to make us more productive, more efficient, not to replace. I absolutely wiped the floor with him one day when I caught him negotiating fees with a client via email. I'm like, what are you doing? You know, you guys all know this stuff. I know I'm not teaching rookies, but you know, my point to him was, how can you see what your clients? or my client in that instance, what their reaction is to your offer. You can't see the whites of their eyes, you can't hear the intonation in their voice. So you're making offers by email and that client is countering them and all you're doing is just giving away, giving away, giving away. I was really, really cross. Um, finally on Stefan, I will tell you, his favourite catchphrase, do you want to know what it is? <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm laughing now, it used to really make me cry because he was proud of it. He actually had it, I think, stuck to his, uh, his, uh, his computer monitor. Stefan's favourite phrase was, I love deadlines. That was it. I love deadlines. And underneath, I like the sound they make as they whiz past my head. <laughs> I'm not kidding, right? This was a guy. My fault, my fault was that, that I let my personal likes influence um, my decision to recruit. I put a halo around this guy. You guys all know about halo and horns. I put a definite halo around this guy, um, but not for long, right? So I, I, but one of my difficulties, and again, if you're an owner that's got somebody like a Stefan sitting there, the change actually happened when I had my first child because he was, you know, a, a little baby, and um, Stefan was working with me at the time, and I used to come into the office after being with my, you know, first son, you know, my first child and uh, I used to look at Stefan and, and before my son was born, I just used to tolerate everything, I suppose I was in a good mood because the baby and everything, but when, when my son was born, I used to come in and I used to see this guy just sitting day after day, never picking up the phone, I looked at his call stats, I looked at you know, his uh, KPR, he just wasn't picking up the phone and when I had that child, it's like all of a sudden, I made the connection in my head that he was stealing food from my kid's mouth. It wasn't true because uh, my son wasn't eating food there. But that was the, the, the connection that I needed to make, that this guy was actually robbing me. And he wasn't. You know, he wasn't a dishonest person. He was just a lazy person. Um, but look, essentially I put Steph on, on uh, micro-reporting, uh, you know, daily management, KPIs. Eventually he agreed he couldn't do the job and we both moved on, he left. Now my advice to you, okay, so what can you learn from this? Don't take on low energy, passive people in your business. Just don't touch them. 
all right? Don't touch the person that comes in and like slouches over the chair. Don't touch them. I could see that with Stefan. He was so laid back, his neck would have snapped at interview. I shouldn't have employed him. Don't just take on someone because you like them, even if they can get you tickets to the team. And funny enough, he actually didn't even get me the tickets. Right. Um, let me let me introduce you to Interpol Ian. All right, for our American cousins over there. Uh, Interpol, I suppose, would be the equivalent to your Federal Bureau of in Investigation. Uh, Interpol is like the European version of that. Now, this isn't strictly I, a mistake that I made for myself. So I didn't employ Ian. He was someone that I placed, right? But the story is so bizarre that I won't really wanted to share it with you. So it wasn't necessarily my mistake. But what did I learn from it? It's the most important thing. Let me tell you about this guy. Um, I placed Ian as a, a general manager um, for a major fashion retailer at their flagship store in Kensington in London. Uh, this was their busiest store, right? So absolutely it was like their flagship, beautiful looking, brand new. Um, this guy was good. It, my client was delighted with his performance in the, in the six month build up to Christmas, uh, which was their busiest trading period as you can imagine. He broke, Ian broke all previous um, turnover and profit stats for similar sized stores within their organization and they loved him so much that within six months they were talking about grooming him for a possible um, director's role until until I received a call from the ops director who I'd known for a long time long-standing uh, personal client friend in fact of mine just after Christmas all right so it was Boxing Day or the day after but so sorry Christmas Day it was the 26th 27th of December that he phoned me and he explained that the Kensington store had turned over more money in the last two weeks than any other store in their I don't know, hundreds of stores that they had. Um, and it had broken, uh, sorry, he had broken the all time um, takings record uh, for that company. Now, I must admit, I'm getting this call, you know, the day after Christmas. I thought I'm in for a bonus. So I'm, I'm like, you know, I've spent all my money at Christmas. I'm like, oh, wow, clients phone me just after Christmas to tell me how much money they're taking in this store because of this guy that I placed there. Woohoo! And I was spending the money in my head. I'm like, wow, I'm going to take this out to the January sales and spend some money. Unfortunately, well, in fact, I tell you what, he, he told me at that point the reason for his call was to ask what our guarantee period was <laughs> and did it cover major fraud okay now I, I know all you recruiters out there you'll be um, uh, blessing yourselves and, and, and a real sigh of relief to know that it, the, the, the candidate our rebate period wasn't six months I think it was 12 weeks and uh, and our rebate uh, guarantees didn't certainly didn't cover major fraud because I'd have had that thing that you guys had in uh, what is it? References of the responsibility of the client, right? We, I know that's in there. But um, let me tell you the story about Ian. Unfortunately, it became apparent that Ian had locked the shop up on Christmas Eve and he'd vanished into the night with over three quarters of a million pounds sterling in cash. I'm just going to say that figure once more time. Three quarters of a million pounds in cash. Now, according to Interpol, he was wanted across Europe for three similar crimes, fraud, um, and they were very interested in tracing him to answer some um, some pressing questions that they had. The lesson I learned, and I follow to this day, because of Interpol, Ian, this is what I do. Even though our terms and conditions normally absolve us of any legal responsibility for taking references on behalf of our clients, I always what's the word always personally okay that's the other word personally I don't delegate this I always personally check the references with previous employers on everyone everyone I employ to work with me so I don't care if you're joining me as their bookkeeper the accountant a recruiter another trainer a PA a direct whatever it is I will personally call your you know previous bosses and I will talk to them director to director MD to MD um, this is not something I delegate to human resources this is not someone that I get a secretary or my, P or my, my PA to do this is something that I want to do myself
and I'll ask them in a phone call. It's not a reference. I'll ask them in a phone call. Look, you know, this guy's coming to work for me. How can I manage him or her to get the best out of them? How did you find managing him or her? Is there anything I should be aware of? How can I get the best out of this person? What are they going to give me? Um, anything that's going to help me help the person that's coming to work for me, vitally important, never ever delegate it. Okay, I've got a few more people that I just want to share with you before we move on. Three of the last people. These ones, quick, not quite right Natalie, all right? Not quite right Natalie. I will tell you, not quite right Natalie's are not always um, called Natalie. Sorry, in this instance, I've called her Natalie, but uh, Nathaniel. Okay, so, you know, c c can be blokes as well. Not quite right Nathaniel's as well as Natalie's. Um, it's usually when I've been desperate to fill a desk. I've got an empty space and I'm really desperate to recruit and I, I take on someone that just doesn't quite fit the bill. And I think back um, on every single one where my gut instinct was literally screaming at me. You know, I put it down to hunger. It was like I probably went and got a pie or a sandwich or something. But my gut was instinct was screaming at me not to take them on. But for some reason, I don't know whether my brain just got a bypass or whatever, I chose to ignore my gut and get them in. What happens? What happens to us? It's like, duh. Um, I realize, right, it's hard stroke near impossible to get ticks in all the boxes. There is no such thing as the perfect recruiter. And by the way, if you find them, please let me know. And if they've got any brothers or sisters, I'll be you know, mad keen to employ them. They don't exist. You, you know, it's, it's near impossible to get ticks in all the boxes and, and recruit perfection every single time. But I would recruit these people and I'd adopt them like a project. I'd adopt them like a martyr takes on um, a mission. I'd say things to you like, I'm sure that they're going to work out in the long run. I'd be justifying that. I'd be saying that thing right up until the time that we get rid of them. I'm sure they're going to work out. I'm sure they'll be okay. We just give them enough time. Um, uh, I, you know, the other one I used to say is, and, and I'm kicking myself now, I'll get them bealing even if it kills me. How often have you said that? You know, I'm get this person billing. I'm good. I'm I'm good at developing people. I'm going to get them going, even if it kills me. Um, invariably, it does, and at the very least, it saps your energy. All right. So, not quite right, Natalie's. You put more effort, more time, blood, sweat, and tears into uh, dealing with a situation. Um, and it never gets right, okay? It's never going to get right. The lesson for all of us, never, ever, ever, write this one down, never, ever settle for second best, okay? Never, ever settle for second best. You've worked damned hard, again, forgive my profanity, but you worked damned hard to build your recruitment business. And quite frankly, you deserve more, okay? Why would you settle for second best? Um, I, you know, I, I know you want the best for your kids, you want the best for your family, you want the best for your friends. Why wouldn't you want the best for your own business? The place that you spend so much time, this, the place that you put your soul into, why wouldn't you want the best for that? Don't accept second best. If you can't visualize passing your best client to this person, I'm pointing at Natalie, by the way, on the screen. If you can't visualize passing your best client to not so right Natalie, not quite right Natalie, at some point in the future, don't recruit them. Don't recruit them. I'm not telling you to give them your best client. I'm just saying to you, picture it. And if you can't see it, don't take them on. Um, quickly, Dominic, my way's better. <laughs> yeah, spending spoons, right? Dominic was, um, he was a graduate. You know, very, very intelligent guy. Worked in sales before, second job of sales. Young, articulate, reasonably well presented. Um, I've got the feeling that he's borrowed his suit from his dad or he'd got it from a charity. He was about two or three sizes too big for him. But apart from that, the guy was smart, he was articulate, he was educated, etc., etc. But the writing was on the wall during the first two days of his induction. All right. Um, Within the first two days, I know, because he failed to achieve any of the small, easily achievable activity targets. So even though it was his induction, I'd, I'd do you know training or development in the morning. I'd then set him loose for the day, and I'd give him a really small activity target. It's what I teach now. Don't 
molly coddle somebody, bring them in and, and you know, train them, sure, but get them achieving, set them targets from day one, small achievable targets. Dominic couldn't even touch the targets that I set him. They were small, but he just wasn't even doing them. Instead, he came back to me at the end of each day telling me that he'd been really thinking about his role and that he had some amazing ideas on how we could achieve our new business goals in different ways. Different to the tried and tested ways that we'd worked at our company very successfully for the you know for the last three years. Dominic was like, "Wow, I, I know how to do this. Two days training, two day, in fact, two half days working it." Um, but look, I didn't want to rain in his parade. None of us do, right? We have young guy, you know, young people in front of you. They're enthusiastic. You don't want to, you know, rain on their parade. So, but I had seen it before. People who try to change the system before they understand the system, and in my experience, they rarely, rarely ever work out. You know, you'll get the odd anomaly. I'm sure the odd Richard Branson that will come along and um, say to you, "Look, the way you're doing it is wrong. Maybe you should do it this way." And that's cool. If you get them, great. You know, let's go for it. But you and I know what it takes to be successful in our recruitment business. Beware of someone that comes in and asks you to change that without really understanding it first. Um, you know, I, I cut him some slack. I, you know, I didn't want to rain his parade. I just said to him, "Look, I really like you." Um, so I told him to try it his way for a week, um, and then compare the results that he gets to his targets. Right? Because I wasn't going to take those away. I just said, "Like, you do the targets. I don't care how you do it for one week. Let's just go with your way." Um, I, I said to him, "Look, if you overachieve, I'll eat my hat. I'll, you know, clearly I'll put my hand up and say I was wrong. Um, but if he..." If you bomb, you've got to promise to do it our way. He promised. He bombed in spectacular style. Guy went down in flames, and instead of doing it our way, he left after um, just two more weeks. So look, the lesson for all of us: look for ingenuity, look for intelligence, look for, you know, if qualifications are a prerequisite of your job, definitely, definitely look for those things. But beware of people who want to change what you do from the start. Okay. I don't mind people coming in and making revisions to you know, my business. I, I've always believed in constant, never-ending improvement. Um, it's a principle that you know, people like Apple have, have you know, built a whole philosophy and uh, um, you know, an industry off of. But um, I, I just don't like people coming in that are brand new, that don't understand the way you do it. Um, and then and then I try and suggest a different way to you. Look, my final howl, I've saved the best till last. My final one, this is one that I warn all of my coaching clients about. Um, but, you know, I've committed this same sin myself. So this is one of those cases of uh, do as I say rather than do as I do. My mate Johnny got fired. Okay, so he got the, he got the sack from, um, from the job that he was doing. And I wanted to help him out. I wanted to, um, uh, to, he was a friend of mine, so I, I took him on. And John was a brilliant, brilliant manager. Uh, he promised to help me deal with the staff. He just said to me, look, I'll take your headache away. He did. Um, and for a while, it was really, really good. Really good. It's nice to have somebody that you know the quality of their work and you trust them and they trust you. We worked really, really well. He worked well. He earned great money. Uh, more money than he'd had done previously. He put in place some good systems, but for our part, we trained him up fully. Um, I, you know, I gave him responsibility. I paid him on time. Again, that wasn't something he was used to, but I introduced him to my best clients. Okay, because he was good, he was quality, and it just meant that you know I could do the things I wanted to do. But after a year, you know, and how familiar is this, right? After a year, Johnny um, came to me and he asked to be given equity, given equity in the business, in my business, a business that I'd started by myself. The risk was 100% mine in terms of taking it on. I'd grown it by myself for three years prior. And for any of you guys that have had your businesses in excess of three years, you'll know that first three years is really tough. Talk about a roller coaster. So um, I explained this to John, and I politely refused. Remember, he was my friend, so I politely refused. But I said, I didn't want to shut the door on him. I said to him, look, I'd be happy to put in place an equity share incentive scheme you know, based on performance, or happy to consider giving away some equity, but in exchange for investment. So I was happy to consider these things and put them in place. 
John wasn't happy, so Johnny ended up leaving me, starting a rival agency. <laughs> he did me a favour, he did, did take my non-performing sales manager with him, so that was most welcome. Do you remember Stefan? Um, and, um, and he tried to acquire the clients that I'd given him, you know, the ones I'd given him to work with. And I think he won one of them because of um, he just offered a, a heavily discounted rate. But look, you know, all's fair in love and war. I, I started a recruitment business by, you know, moving away from somebody. Most of us have. So, you know, no ill feeling. But there's a final lesson for us all in this, all right? It's not about, uh, you know, taking people on and not taking people on and trying to protect what you've got. It's about helping friends and family. Um, helping them by employing them very rarely works out. It's different. I've got, in my group, I've got two sets of sisters that set the business up together. So two sisters set their business up, two sisters set their business up, and they've been together setting the business up. But where you bring a friend or a family into an existing business that you've got, just be careful because there are sadly few exceptions uh, where it goes right and it pays off. You're better off building your own business and then giving those friends and family help in other ways. You know, if you can support them, perhaps help them to start their own business without you. But be very, very wary. Okay? Killer questions that you must ask to determine who's going to succeed and who's going to absolutely flop. All right? Um, by the way, these questions that I'm going to give you, I'm going to run through them quickly. Um, they're included in that three interview superstar selection sequence, that ebook that I wrote. Um, I'm going to email you the PDF Im immediately after this session ends, all right? So you're going to get um, an email from me. Watch out for it in your inbox. Mark it as a you know, safe sender or safe list or whatever it is um, th that you have because I want to get that through to you. It, very, very powerful book. It sold, I can't remember, I think for about um, uh, £10, £17, something like that. So I'm going to give that to you free, the PDF for that, that particular book. So nine killer questions, just, just go through them, um, rattle through. The first one is, what do you want? Now this is intentionally vague, all right? I don't want you to just hit them with it as they walk through the door. So what do you want? It, it's not that, but it's, it's, it's intentionally vague. You know, what do you want? What are you looking for? What is it that you want from a career working with us? Look for an answer that indicates a striver, a go-getter, someone that's ambitious. You really want to hear that. You know, what you don't want to hear is, what do you want? Well, I'm just looking for a job. You know, I've heard that one before. It doesn't really inspire me <laughs> to want to take them on. Second question, if you could have any job you wanted, what would it be? If you could have any job you wanted, what would it be? Look for an answer here that indicates desire. Desire for power or money or excitement or progression or something. But, you know, you're looking for someone that's just like really fired up. If you could have any job, what, you know, and you know the best ones. I've had people go, I want your job. If you could have any job you want, what would it be? It'd be, I want your job in two years or three years or five years. I want to be sitting in your chair. I want to run a business. Um, you know, don't be scared of that, by the way, owners. If somebody comes and says, I want to be, I want to own my own business, brilliant, embrace it. Don't get protective, support them, make them the best damn advert for your recruitment business that there is. And you never know. Sometimes there are things when you develop somebody through a business, you can do it properly, but when you develop them, there's a chance for you to invest in creating a second business that's headed up by somebody else you know maybe you're the major equity or, or a major shareholder or whatever but um, look for that kind of opportunity right question three is money important to you answer the only acceptable answer I want you to hear is yes it's the only acceptable answer beware of someone who says no you know money's not my god um, I've heard that one before in fact I probably said that at once in my interviews money's not my god it's like is money important to you of course it is unless you're living in a cave you've got no expectations and you want to I don't know go and live on an ashram or something great but at some point you're gonna have to pay the rent at some point you're gonna have to you know buy things and uh, I don't know at some point you might be supporting your family so and at the very least supporting yourself in in later life so is money important to you you damn right it is number four what are your specific income goals now and five years from now 
producers producers know that figure. They don't even have to think about it. You'll hear it come out of their mouths the moment that question ends. They'll say, right, this year I want to be earning at least 50,000. Next year I want to be doing, or sorry, in the next five years I want to be earning 100,000 plus per year. Whatever that figure is, and it's all relative, you know, I, I'm not saying to you everyone's going to be looking at those figures, but you're looking for somebody that's striving. They're keen to earn lots of money. One of my mentors, one of the people that I mentioned earlier on, he used to look for, so that narrows it down, he used to look for people with big expenses, you know, people that, uh, and, and you know, don't shoot the messenger on this, he'd look for people that had children, that were married, that um, had mortgages, that people that had, uh, you know, expensive cars, um, repayments, uh, etc. Ex-wives. Um, he, he'd look for people that were loaded up with expenses because his reasoning, and actually he was proven right time and time again, right? His reasoning was that if they needed to earn money, they worked harder to earn money. So, you know, take a leaf out of that one. I would never advocate get people into debt, right? I'm not saying that, but it's amazing. The people that you know, and I've been there, you guys have been there, when our back's against the wall, it's amazing how uh, we can pull stuff out of a bag, right? So, yeah. Um, question number five, what would you do with 100,000 a year, insert your own figure here, if you were earning it right now? The big hitter, the big biller, the person that you want working for you, the person who really wants it is going to have a very detailed answer to this question. All right, a very detailed answer to this question. Maybe it's a car, maybe it's a deposit on a flat, maybe it's a holiday. I spoke to somebody last week in one of my clients and um, she was planning her wedding for next year. Big, big reasons why um, she would be spending, I'm sure, in excess of 100,000 next year. Um, number six, why do you want to come into this business? Uh, you know, I like asking people that. Good answers are going to include, I want to make a lot of money, or I really want to prove something to myself, or to my family, or to my friends. Um, I want to, um, I, you know, I want to progress, I want to travel, I want to, whatever it is, I want to achieve my goals. Bad answers, okay, bad answers include, I like people, or I want to help people. I'm not saying that's bad, I just wouldn't see it as the primary motivator for a big hitter coming into a recruitment business. I like the fact that they like people, but it's, um, you know, we've got to remember this isn't a, a, a you know, job service, this is a commercial employment business. We get paid to match candidates to client opportunities and make good matches, i.e. ones that stay. It's not a bums on seats operation, it's about good quality work that we can repeat and repeat and repeat. So bad answers are, you know, I want to help people or I don't want to work nights. That was one I heard. Um, and the other one I heard was, this was funny because the guy said to me, I don't want to work weekends. <laughs> I think he was from retail where he had to work Saturdays and Sundays all his life. And I said to him, oh, well, tough. It's, uh, you know, recruitment's not a 24-7 uh, sorry, it's not a nine to five Monday to Friday. Um, recruitment's like being a, a, a police officer. Um, you know, you're always on duty, twenty four seven, three six five. So, um, why do you want to come into this business? Bad answer will be, I don't want to work weekends. What kind of environment allows you to be the most successful? Really simple. Whatever they tell you, it should be like your environment or one that you can easily create. Beware of people say, oh, you know, I really like it to be quiet. Because when it's quiet, I do my best work. You know, I don't like, I don't like stress all around me. I, I like it really quiet, quiet office where you can hear a pin drop. Um, no, nah, not good, not good, not good for you. Unless you're a library, and then uh, you wouldn't be running a recruitment business from there. Right. Final question. Sorry, not final question. Penultimate question. Are you persuasive? Again, there's only one acceptable answer. Shout it at your screen. It's yes. Um, but then ask them. This is the most important one. It's not that question, are you persuasive? It's your secondary question to that, almost like 8A. Ask them to explain or justify why. So are you persuasive? Yes. That's interesting. Why do you describe yourself as that? If they say, are you persuasive? No. That's interesting. Why do you say that? Just get them to justify whatever answer they've they've given you. All right? Are you persuasive? 
I'm hoping that it's going to be a yes, and I'm hoping that they're going to be able to convince you that they are. Final question, your nine killer questions. Describe your greatest success and your greatest failure. Describe your greatest success and your greatest failure. Beware of the person that says they've never failed. Right? I, you know, I always smile when I get those in the room. It's like, no, I've never failed in my life. It's like, oh, that's a shame because, you know, I don't know about you, but I, I always learn from mistakes. Kids, babies don't learn to walk just suddenly one day jumping up. How do they learn to walk? That's right, by falling down. So, you know, I like people that have had some failure in their life because it's about how you respond to that. It's about how you get up and, you know, face those demons and get back on with it. And that builds, you know, strength, strength in adversity. So, good. Okay. Those are your nine questions. Um, Remember at the very beginning of t uh, today's webinar, I said to you, I made you a promise, and I said to you at the beginning, I'm going to give you one killer strategy that I've used to determine winners and losers during interview. I never, ever, ever leave this strategy out. Um, I told you uh, earlier about some of my amazing mentors and, and who helped sh shape my early recruiting career. I learned so many things from each of them, all right? loads and loads of stuff. But one thing that sticks in my mind, you know, of all of the things they taught me, one thing sticks in my mind above all the rest is something that Tony Byrne gave me that I want to give you today. So I want to share that with you today. Um, it is part of, again, that three interview selection sequence. I think it's featured in there. So, you know, by all means, take notes and write the stuff down now. But when you get that booklet, you should be able to see it in there as well in its entirety. So here's the deal. When you're interviewing a potential new recruiter for your business, whether you've asked them the nine killer questions or whether you've got your own format, it doesn't really matter. But when you, they've done that kind of interview with you, sorry, and you're in the interview, done that interview with you, I want you to, um, there's a couple of things that I mentioned in the book, but one of the things I want you to do is give them a work test. Now, that sounds really boring. You're thinking, oh my God, this was the killer strategy. You're going to get them down in front of a computer and type a few words. No, this is a work test on steroids, okay? What I want you to do is I want you to give the rookie a completed job brief or a complete job brief. Now, you veteran recruiters, you know exactly what I'm talking about, okay? I don't want a job description. I don't want a war and peace. I don't want a four-line job description that's the client has sent over. I want a complete recruitment brief. Uh, you guys that have got the book downloads, you'll know I've, I've got a template in there for you. Client brief, I, I think we call it the client brief. Uh, dummy template or blank template, that's what I'm talking about. It's one of those completed. So lots of information, the fullest information that you've got. I also give them the job brief, get them to read it. I then want you to give them, give them 15 CVs of candidates on your CRM on your database that could do the job. All right, let's make it really easy. This isn't a, you know, let's check their Boolean search strings or whatever. I'm not expecting that. I want you to make it really easy for them. Give them a job brief, give them 15 CVs, and I also want you to give them a mini script. All right, I'm going to word that script for you now, but I want you to give them a mini script. Now, before you give them the script, I want you to look at your own job brief and I want you to write down two to three reasons why the opportunity is brilliant um, that you've given them. Okay, I want you to make it really easy so that the rookie can just literally read these two to three reasons. And you know the stuff I'm talking about. This is a brilliant opportunity um, for someone to join a company ground level. Within three years, they'll own a chunk of equity. This is a great opportunity for someone looking to establish themselves you know, in this growing marketplace Greenfield opportunity, blah, 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 right? So you're going to write this stuff down for them. Now, look, the script, I'm going to give the wording to you, right? So if you want to, write this down. It's something along the lines of, hi, Bill. Bill is obviously the uh, the, um, uh, the person on the CV, right? So the candidate, sorry, the candidate's name that's on the CV, right? So um, insert name. I'm a research assistant for Roy Ripper. Obviously, insert your own name. Don't get them to use mine. Just it would not work too well. 
um, people always just be laughing at the names like Roy Ripper. Yeah, you just made that up. So um, hi, Bill. I'm a research assistant for Roy Ripper. Roy's doing a search for a senior analyst. Insert job title. Roy's doing a search for a senior analyst. He's asked me to give you a call because you might know someone who'd be a good candidate for this position. Then have the rookie sell them two to three reasons, the reasons that you've given them, why the position is, why the role is good, why the opportunity is good that you've given them. So they prefix those reasons with that little intro script. Their outro statement is just four words. I want you to write these words down. So they've given the, the, the prefix script, they've then given the two to three reasons why the opportunity is absolutely brilliant. The final four words are, you probably guess them, who do you know? Question mark. Not do you know somebody? Because that's a you know it's a closed question. I don't. I'm not anti-closed questions. They're great when you want to close someone. But who do you know is a lovely open question. It will get you, hopefully, lots of lovely open information. So let's give this person the best chance. Now, that work test. Okay, that work test. This, and the way that I set this up with them is I, I'll say to them, look, I, I'm actually going to get you to be a recruiter for the next half an hour. They're like, wow, a bit scared, a bit trepidation, but wow, you know, this isn't me grilling them in an interview and shining a light in their eyes and saying, you know, uh, would you sell me the inside of this ping pong ball. Um, this is a work test and, and I want to see them perform. Um, this is much better than any artificial role play that you that you know you know the ones that sell this position to me. That's like you know it's not bad, but this is better. Look for someone. This is what you're looking for from the thing. Are you expecting results? No. If they get one, that's a bonus. All right. So don't just take someone on because like wow, they spoke to 15 people and they got all 15 people interested. There's something about them, but don't take that as you know they're absolutely brilliant. Still quiz it and challenge it. But conversely, if the person doesn't convert any of them, um, that's not you know you're not looking for a direct result in order to take them on. Don't expect perfection. What you're looking for is someone who gets on and picks the phone up. You know, I love watching people do this exercise because some of them will be like, brilliant, thank you for that. Read, 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 read. Right, where's the phone? Picking it up, dialing. They just jump straight in, fearless, no, no fear. They don't care if they make an absolute ass of themselves. They're just going to play full out, all right? I can work with that. Um, don't expect perfection because you and I together, we can train that. Look for aptitude, look for confidence, look for enthusiasm. Because um, those skills, uh, sorry, you know, those are traits, those are characteristics. Skills, recruitment skills, we can teach those. All right, You and I together can teach those. The book that you've got has given you instruction in terms of how to do that.